Thank you. Glad to be here. Welcome, Jay. This is a great honor. Thank you. I'm honored to be here with you guys. Yeah, it's Lamas, actually. <laughs> I'm so, the time is going so fast. I didn't even realize until I looked on the calendar. First harvest. Anyway, let's, let's get into it. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're if you're going by the farmer's wheel. So I mean it has a lot there's a lot more also that we don't need to get into here, but yeah, it's good idea, Jer. Good idea. Although I say search. Oh, right. My reminder to turn my phone off. Anyway, Jay, let's let's dive right in. Okay. Dreams. And um, I, I, we like to start with kind of your early, your early life and experience. So the things that, as far back as you can remember, your earliest uh, memories of the world. So anything that, you know, hard symbols like nature, TV programming, uh, pink lemonade, you know, just your earliest memories. Earliest memories in dreams or earliest memories? Earliest memories in life. And then if you have um, dreams that tie into early childhood, that would be awesome to tie those in. Uh, earliest dream, I guess, or uh, memory would, would, I guess, be, I don't know, being uh, in a uh, child stroller type thing when I was four, three or four, somewhere in there. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, what, <laughs> what else do you want? <laughs> well, like, what things stick out in your early childhood? So did you like watching cartoons? Did you like playing outside? I guess what we're trying to do is kind of get an idea of the symbols that kind of formed your world so that as we talk about dreams and dreaming and all that, there's an idea of where you come from. Uh, well, I come from Tennessee, so I guess, uh, you know, playing outside nature, streams, the lake, uh, those kind of things would be formative for me as a child. Um, growing up um, at the my grandmother's house and my parents' house, um, having a cat, uh, uh, pretty standard i guess kid stuff I, I i can't think of anything that really stands out as like a out of place or abnormal when it comes to early childhood dreams did you like cartoons were you a looney tunes kid or i uh, sure um, my era of cartoons was the early 80s so he-man yes um <laughs> G.I. joe um Hanna-Barbera, um, 
so not really Lo looney tunes was more prior to my day um that was you know 60s 50s type stuff so mm -hmm. well, plus everything was going around on nick at night and nickelodeon by the well, 80s I, I lived in uh, no, in in 1983, four, I, I lived in a small, very, very small town in Tennessee. So uh, we only had satellite, I mean, not satellite, um, antenna. And the antenna would only pick up, you know, three channels. So, but, you know, when it came to cartoons, there was a very limited scope of, of what you could see, which was basically just whatever the networks would play at certain times. Did you, were you outdoors a lot? Yeah, yeah, my family is uh, a lot of hunting and fishing guides and that kind of stuff. So I grew up, at least until uh, my dad entered the military, I grew up with that kind of of a um, of an atmosphere for sure. Excellent. Yeah, I, I like to nature myself. Did you, um, as you, so as you get a little bit older, like say. I don't know, elementary school age, that period, what kind of stuff was interesting you in the world? What, what, what drew your attention? Um, by the time of elementary school, I was probably pretty early drawn to the arts in general. So I liked to draw and um, I liked music a lot. Uh, I liked movies a lot from an early age. Um, so that was probably what started my whole bent towards the arts and probably I would say, I guess, continuing with the, uh, the cartoon um, period was probably my most obvious access to the arts throughout elementary. And then, you know, you go to theme parks when you're a kid, you go to SeaWorld, you go to Disney. Uh, my mom worked for a company that owned at the time owned SeaWorld, it was a publishing company. So oh, nice. Uh, we had, uh, we pretty much go to SeaWorld, you know, whenever. Um, I lived in San Diego at that, at that time. So, um, you know, there was a lot of parks, a lot of field trips, that kind of stuff in San Diego to Balboa Park, that kind of stuff. Do you remember any dreams that kind of stuck out in this period? Um... Um, I always have a really, really vivid dreams. Um, so even if I fall asleep for, you know, like five minutes, I'm, I'm immediately dreaming. So I don't, my mind, I guess, has had such a rush of dreams over the years that I can't remember any specific dreams during that period that stand out. But, uh, I mean, I've always had, you know, really intense, really, um, really elaborate uh wild dreams everything from you know stories that were almost like complete movies playing out to um you know played out musical uh pieces like entire uh, songs um comedy skits even entire skits playing out in my head in my dreams um to very uh abstract um trippy things at times um all kinds of of very extreme dreams nothing nothing too bad though most of the time i don't really have nightmares i've had maybe i don't know maybe one bad dream or nightmare uh, every five or six months maybe when but you nothing have from that nothing from that period stands out as uh as something that you know that was it, specific it back is, there it is memorable when you were so kind of in the did, has your dream landscape shifted at all, though? So it's not, you definitely sound like a prolific dreamer. Was there a time when, so do you experience dreams in black and white? Let me start there. No, I've never had a black and white dream. They're always color. They're always uh, very vivid. Um, uh, there's almost kind of an architecture to the dream world. Uh, I think that there seem to be recurring ones that seem to be in certain um places that and and it, i'm not i can't prove this but I've, I've wondered at times if there isn't uh, an actual consistent maybe um, landscape of the dream architecture 
that is consistent over time. So in other words, is, is the, the path, for example, or the, the journey that I might take in traveling. So a lot of times in my dreams, I'm traveling like across the U.S. or something. Um, it seems to be fairly consistent. So in other words, the, the path that I take in the dream to get to, say, California from Tennessee, which is a frequent one, it seems to be the same. It seems to, to be fairly regular uh, in different dreams. So it's not the exact same dreamscape uh, or, or uh, repeated dream over and over and over, recurring dream. Uh, I've had some recurring dreams, but actually uh, I kind of think that there's perhaps, this is just a, a theory I toy with, is the possibility that there is actually an inner structure to the dream world that is consistent. Yeah, I agree. I, I experienced that even though sometimes like I have a house I live in generally and it, it shifts, it's the same house, but it shifts, you know, so it's always kind of the same house. Um, right. Yeah. The, the detail, the, the sort of extraneous details can morph, uh, but there seems to be an underlying structure that doesn't change. And with this, not everyone we talk to experiences this. And so I'm, it's curious. I like to talk about it a minute more with this um kind of observation of a structure uh that we observe here in waking life do you get a sense that you're actually having is there a sense that it's because there's architecture because there's a structure because you recognize it are you living a life there as well that is any way comparable to maybe this experience, you know, obviously slightly different. I would say in some dreams, it seems that way. Uh, I've had dreams about those, those uh, storylines playing out as alternative versions of, of my life, but not necessarily in every dream, no, but sometimes yes. You had mentioned earlier about um, having dreams that spanned, you know, that could span like a lifetime. Do you have an example of one of those maybe? Well, I, I don't know that it spans a lifetime. I do think there's a uh, change in the experience of time and space in dreams. For example, sometimes if you doze off, uh, I've noticed that you'll, something will seem like a very long time in the dreamscape and then you kind of wake up and you realize that you really only nodded off for you know a minute or two so i think that the experience of time has to in some way be very different in the dreamscape um i don't exactly know what it is or how to calculate that but it does seem to be different um but i'm not saying that in one night i had an entire lifetime of a dream I, I don't i think that would be a little much i can't i don't have any any example of that so not a whole roy game not what <laughs> not a whole game of roy from rick and morty roy what is that it was a rick and morty thing that a, a, a video game where you put a helmet on and you like live a virtual life of a guy until he dies oh okay it was kind of cool i i have actually had those where i went through beginning to end in probably what was a very short amount of time here, but it felt, yeah. felt significant and long in these. So, okay. So let's back up a little <clears throat> in your, in the details of how you dream, what are the, some of the components, the nuances, so like sound and touch and the senses we experience here, are they congruent or are they different? Are they amplified? How do you generally um, experience those things? Uh, fairly congruent, maybe a little amplified. I mean, it seems a little, a little more intense, but uh, things carry over as they seem to carry over in this world. So, uh, you know, if, you, if, if I'm in a place or if I'm going somewhere, if I'm talking to someone, you know, all the details are very precise. So it doesn't seem like you know, fuzzy or hazy, or it seems very lucid, very clear. How's the, um, the quality of sound for you? Uh, always pretty, pretty standard. I mean, there's not, there's not any, um, alteration that I can recall for sounds. Okay, cool. Normative. S 
And and so in in this kind of realm where we are with this conversation right now, what about where does what do you think about lucidity and where does that fall or how does that happen for you within the dream? Uh, I have uh, lucid dreams quite frequently. Uh, most of the time when I become lucid in the dream, I attempt to study the dream world best I can before waking up uh, because for whatever reason, lucid dreaming seems to hasten the waking up period. It seems to come pretty quick. So, um, I mean, it, it happens pretty frequently. I would say at least once a week, I have a lucid dream probably, maybe, maybe once every 10 days. Um, but it doesn't really, um, doesn't usually amount to, I mean, it's happened so frequently that I don't really, it's almost kind of, uh, expected. It's almost kind of normal now. So it doesn't, it's not surprising to me or unique. It's, it's pretty standard. So, um, my dreams tend to go in cycles or phases. Um, so like I said, there's maybe one bad dream every six months. But normatively speaking, the dreams are pretty vivid uh, journeys, quests, uh, encountering uh, a lot of celebrities, encountering people from my past. Um, every now and then they're a bit fantastical with uh, angels or demons or uh, beings or something like that. Um, there might be something like a portal or there might be these kinds of things every now and then. Um, there might be some fairly abstract, surrealist-looking uh, architecture um, at times, but typically it's not um, too crazy. In other words, you know, there's not like you know anything extreme going on, like uh, people getting killed or anything like that. It's 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 usually me uh, on some some journey of discovery. Cool. I definitely want to get back to some of those details, like the the portals and the woo woo stuff. I want to get. I do, I do, by the way, have a lot of dreams about um, uh, tornadoes, uh, but that's because you know this is pretty much tornado alley. Um, so every now and then there are, I'd say maybe once every couple months, I have <laughs> dreams where there's like six tornadoes coming. Oh, wow. You're in California now? No, I live in Tennessee. Okay. Um, yeah, Neighbor. that's definitely... Neighbors. There's tornadoes there. True, Jerry's in Georgia. Georgia. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just in Georgia not too long ago. Sweet. Are you going up to CryptidCon? And half my family's there. In September? Do what? CryptidCon, the Bigfoot convention. <laughs> No, I didn't, I didn't know what that is. It's some. Cri- <laughs> it's a crazy. Cri- it's a crypto cryptozoology. I didn't even know oh, that was going on, Jerry. Cryptid. Are, are you a, a student of uh, I am not. Sasquatch? I am not. Okay. I'm more of a mocker, but I know it's a thing. You know. Uh, no, I would. Yeah, I would actually go and. Sounds like it rife for making comedy videos. Actually. Exactly why I'm going. <laughs> It's like okay, some, I might I might actually go. <laughs> <laughs> it's in uh, I think Franklin, Kentucky. You guys, <laughs> Franklin, Georgia, Kentucky. Oh, oh, well, yeah, I know where that is. I think it's Frank. I'll look it up. I'll put it in the show notes. Christine. Yeah, there's a bunch of us going up there. A bunch of podcast guys. Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. So when you, when we talk about lucidity, what do you view the different states within a dream? How do you view them? So is there a separation between a lucid dream and astral projection or OBEs and um, some of the other language that may go with being awake essentially within the dream? I don't know that I have any hard and fast categorization of how to distinguish these. I mean. Uh, they could be similar. They could be different. Uh, I mean, they're, they're questions I've pondered, but I, I don't have a definitive answer to that. Um, have you, have you ever had like, um, an out of body well, experience? As far as like, experience. Yeah. yeah. I would say when, uh, when I had a really bad acid trip, I kind of had a, okay. Body. But not like an astral, a 
uh, astral projection like that. I, I guess what, what Nish is kind of getting at is what's the distinction between astral travel and lucid dreaming? Which yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm saying I'm not sure. I, yeah. mean, I On the one hand, I could see the possibility that they're the same. And on the other hand, I could see the possibility that, that that's compl something completely different. In other words, uh, a dream state, even if it's lucid, might still just be the inner world of one's psyche um, and astral projection or something might actually pertain to something, you know, external to the body. I, I don't, I don't honestly know. It's a good question. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's I just, think it's all, even here, I think it's all a matter of states of lucidity. Yeah. What, will you tell us about the LSD trip where you were at, happening out of body? That sounds intriguing. And was that your only one? Say what? I'm, if was, you don't mind. Yeah. I'm, no, I don't care. I'll talk. If you about don't it. mind, I've talked about it on podcasts. It's it's kind of funny, um, but it was a nightmare at the time. But uh, <laughs> no, I think I was seventeen, and we did uh, just one hit. But I think it was pretty strong because, um, and you know, drugs tend to affect me pretty pretty intensely. So um, it was a fairly, I guess, quote normal trip until. Uh, a certain point where I blacked out and I went into the bathroom of the guy's house that we were at, we were partying and I just kind of laid on the floor for about four hours, hoping that I would you know, sober up. And I kind of just dissociated, drifted out of consciousness. And um, the only thing that I recall from it was um, a sort of a single beam of light, like a point of light. And uh, I felt that it was, I don't exactly know what that was. Uh, I tend to think it was something angelic or demonic, probably demonic, um, but maybe I was being warned or something because you know I came away from that feeling uh, that it wasn't uh, it wasn't a good thing to do. So, um, so I know I didn't continue with you know hallucinogens or anything like that. I, I did do LSD some more, but not many more times. And after that, it was kind of you know thing that I didn't feel was healthy. So. Uh, it did have similarities to the dream state. It did seem to be um, kind of a, a blending of the dream state and the, the waking state. In other words, LSD, I'm saying. Um, but yeah, the, the, the sort of out, of out of body experience was, and again, I don't know whether I was in or out of the body, but it was more of a blackout type of thing, you know, um, except that, you know, like if you, if you drink alcohol and you get too drunk and you black out, you're, you're out of it. You know, you, you don't remember things. Uh, this is similar to that, except that you don't, you black out, but you're not out of it. You're still conscious. Nothing like a bad trip to make you say hell no. <laughs> it's like, it took a couple for me and I said goodbye. Yeah, that's, um, I can wholly relate to that experience of wanting to write it out. The disassociative stuff, so is intriguing on the level of compare on the comparative level of um what we experience sometimes in the dream ex you know the experience of dreaming mm -hmm. when you've had these uh so and then back moving back into your lucid stuff within dreams mm -hmm. when you're when you're in those and you you did say that they're usually when close to when you actually wake up um do you find yourself encountering other beings, I guess, or entities that seem like they're not part of your unconscious, that they might be external in some way? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, it's another thing, again, where it could go either way. Um, you know, I've had some, some dreams that seem to have religious significance or to have uh, kind of a, a prophetic significance at times. Um, but as to the source of them, I, I, I couldn't say exactly whether they were uh, pro or, ne or con, and that's because you know you just it's kind of hard to tell. Most of the time, I think if you have discernment, you can you can see if the effects of that phenomena are positive in your life or negative in your life. And uh, if they tend to be positive, then you can you know probably figure that it was if it was from an external source, then it was from a good source. Um, so. I know that, I mean, that's not a very good answer, but, but I don't know what to say. I don't know. I mean, I guess that's part of the mystery, isn't it? We don't, we don't always know the source of, uh, of these things. I, in fact, in the last uh, year, I've had some pretty, pretty strong, strange um, visitations and dreams that I don't really talk about just because, uh, you know, I can't verify what 
that source of that is. So uh, in the Orthodox tradition, we kind of have the, the normative approach to where <clears throat> we don't uh, deny those things, but we also don't rely on those things. So we certainly believe in the possibility of, um, you know, spirits or angels or, or even the demonic, uh, you know, interacting in this world. Um, but because sometimes we might be deceived uh, and we might, you know, follow those things in, too intently, they might lead us astray. So, so we just have a cautionary uh, kind of, uh, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, that was cool. Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to stake my life on a, a dream or something. I'm not going to like, you know, if, it, if I had a dream that, oh, I need to move to Canada or something, you know, I'm not going to move to Canada because of dreams. Even if you had it, like, over and over again, <laughs> I think I would consider it. I guess it would depend on the, yeah, uh, like, what kind of a dream. And, yeah, I mean, maybe if it was over and over and over, and if I felt like it was really important, I guess it could potentially make me at least think about moving to Canada. But uh, Have you uh, ever had any prophetic dreams that you found later oh, yeah. to come true? Yeah. yeah. Anything probably. noteworthy to speak of? Uh, off the top of my head, probably, probably twenty of a, uh, in my lifetime of things that, but uh, seem to come into being. Um, I have a lot of dreams that that relate to kind of big scale uh, changes in like inventions, like things that come to pass in terms of being invented. Um, I've had dreams that relate to uh, what certain people in my life will do, uh, namely like girlfriends or, or that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes uh, dr the dreams I've had s seem to signify um, what might really be going on behind the scenes in a certain situation. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that, we as human beings do have higher senses um, that are able to be uh, activated, I guess you could say. I mean, I think that's part of... Utilized. <laughs> yeah, being made in the image of God. Um, but at the same time, there's kind of a, a cautionary aspect to that as well, that, um, you know, this is something that, for example, amongst a lot of Orthodox saints is pretty prominent. They They have a lot of clairvoyance and they have a lot of um, knowing things ahead of time. And I certainly wouldn't at all class myself as a saint. I'm not saying that at all. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that I've always had, uh, you know, kind of every now and then prophetic dreams, but I'm not trying to make anything special of that because I think it's fairly common. I think, you know, people quite, quite often have those kinds of dreams. Yeah, we, we do hear it a lot. And people think prophetic like end of the world, but I mean, it's just even in your own personal life. You probably no, yeah, have a, most of the time it's right. more related to right. personal life um, or, um, you know, big, big scale type, uh, social changes. Like, um, I've had dreams about my own life and things that I thought would never happen that eventually did happen. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I'll say on that. Do you have any examples to share? Um, I can specifically remember dreams, um, maybe around the age 17 or 18 about meeting certain famous people uh, and then eventually having met famous people. So that kind of a thing has happened. Um, uh, certain actions that girls I would have dated that they, certain things they did, I dreamed about uh, and they did it. <laughs> um, but you know, that something like that could be chalked up. Well, maybe you're just, dreaming about uh, a, a common potential action that somebody could take. Like, you know, somebody decided to go. I, I, don't, I don't remember exactly what it was. But, um, if uh, one of my buddy's dad died, I think, and I, I dreamed about that. Um, Do you remember the dream with his dad? Yeah. yeah. Do you feel comfortable sharing it? Well, that was again also when I was about 18. So the only thing that I remember is having a pretty strong impression 
about that and getting a sense of it. And uh, I woke up and called my called my friend, and sure enough, his dad had passed away. So, um, but again, I, you know, that's kind of a common one. People people do tend to, to have that kind of a sensation or dream pretty frequently too of people dying, uh, friends and relatives dying. So, yeah, but you sometimes the symbols are interesting with the the dream imagery, you know, because it's the language I, that was of when symbols. I was like eighteen. I don't I don't recall. So, when you were talking, when you were speaking earlier about here, one of the reasons why we enjoy doing the show is because none of this is provable. Everyone knows this. And so we kind of all come to the table as equals. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think everyone agrees that there's a, a standard defragging that happens with your personal daily life. And then you get into the juicier, meatier stuff. And, um, so we we remain open and we like to talk about stuff under that guise that none of this is provable. So that's kind of one of our laurels here. So on that note, when you were speaking earlier about... Well, I would say if a person had a strong dream and they predicted something in the future, it would be that would be proof. Right. Well, precog stuff that kind of ties into like remote viewing Mm -hmm. Right. That's different. And that, that does tie into precog. But before we were talking about precog, you were mentioning some, some things that you had, some dreams you'd had recently that you, d you don't really talk about because there's no way to validate them. Um, and for that sake, you've kept them private. I'm paraphrasing you, of course. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But those, I'm, I'm actually interesting in, interested in hearing a couple, and we already know that there's no way to prove them, but the, the imagery is what I'm looking for. Um, I, I'll just say that I had a, a dream with religious significance within the last uh, six months that pertained to um, my own personal religious beliefs and the imagery imagery was very serene and very calm, um, very, uh, almost a sense of rest that, uh, that I, I, I didn't have to continue to worry about where I was going theologically, which is something that's kind of, uh, bugged me for the last, I don't know, 18 years. Um, so I, I feel a lot more at peace and at rest in terms of, of my uh, theological beliefs than I have in, 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 say, 10 years ago. So that's all I will say about the dream is that it was, it was related to that. And the imagery was uh, quite a bit of religious symbology that would pertain to Orthodox Christianity. Sounds, sounds moving. Um, uh, one of the things we usually ask in the beginning before we get pulling too is, were you, you know, what sort of religion were you brought up with? Uh, I was raised uh, Southern Baptist and then uh, throughout high school, I didn't really care about any of that at all. And then by about uh, senior year, 18, uh, I started going back to Bible studies with friends of mine and then got back into uh, evangelical Christianity at that time. And then about age 22 or three, I started going to a Catholic church, got into the history of the church and uh, history of the saints and all that. And then uh, a few years later, eight, nine years later, that led to starting to investigate uh, Orthodox Christianity, which is unique and uh, you know different from both Protestant and Roman Catholic Christianity. So for the last, uh, 10 years or so, uh, my religious experience has mostly, not completely, but mostly been Orthodox Christianity. How different is Orthodox from, say, like evangelical? Are there like different, different silos completely or? Uh, vastly different than mm -hmm. evangelical because the, the, uh, the, the way that the church life plays out is pretty, it would be closer to Catholicism in the sense of you have a church calendar, you have liturgy you have ordered worship you have um you know do actual fixed dogma that you believe right. um none of which is present in, in evangelicalism really and then but it's also different from, from catholicism in the sense that it's not uh 
there's nobody higher than the bishop. So there's no pope. There's no um, central locale in Rome or whatever. Uh, you kind of have decentralized uh, national churches throughout the world. So you have Russian Orthodox, you have Greek Orthodox, you have Romanian Orthodox, you have and they're, uh, they're headed by America. they're headed by bishops. Those churches. Well, what I'm saying is that the there's not like one bishop of say the Church of Russia. There are you know hundreds of I don't know right. How, I don't know exactly how many are, but it's archbishop I think. Well, there's there's the Patriarch of Moscow, but he's just a bishop. Uh, I mean, the, the title is actually just honorary. So gotcha. um, there's nobody higher than any any bishop anywhere. So all the bishops are equal. Who was the guy who went to Antarctica last year or two years ago? He was a Russian Orthodox leader, apparently. Well, that's what the news said. It's, it's not important. It just reminded me of that. I don't know. What was he doing? <laughs> He went down there. Remember when everyone was getting weird about Antarctica, and then like Kerry went down there on election day. And... Yeah, it was all in that same period. It made the it was it was very big news because Kerry went down there? who's Kerry who John, John Kerry. Kerry, one of the presidential candidates at the no, time. I mean, he was, okay. No, he was no, no, he was Secretary no. State. I don't, I don't know who or why anybody went to Antarctica. I mean, I remember when Antarctica was popular in the news. I remember like. Aaron and Melissa Dykes made a video about it, but um, I don't know about what you're talking about. It's the Russian Orthodox Patriarch. Mm -hmm. So you, Kirill went to Antarctica. It's Kirill. It doesn't say his name here. I'm not going to play the video. Trinity Church, out of the Trinity Church. I think it's his church. It's all good. Yeah, he went down there in February of 2018. Kirill is. Well, I mean, I, I would imagine. That Kirill, that's what Jay just said. Yeah, Kirill. Kirill, I found. I would imagine there probably is a, a Russian Orthodox community in uh, that that exists there. I don't know. There's uh, quite a few in Alaska, for example. I like the um, I like this progression though, from Baptist to Orthodox via. Catholicism. It's very well rounded, actually. Just you know, listening to it and kind of being imaginative of of the process of going from one, which seems complete. Like when I think about Southern Baptists, I have family in Georgia. They mm -hmm. some of them are rather kooky. Like there's some, you know, they're not full on in the spiritualist movement, but there's a, you know. Some of them are interesting and they don't, they seem less to me as an outsider. Um, you know, they seem almost kind of woo woo ish. Back. The charismatics. Yes, yeah, some of the Southern Baptist people I've known in Georgia, with, you know, having grown up half time hmm. there, were, were pretty eccentric in some other ways and superstitions. Hmm. I'll put it that way. Uh, yeah, I suppose anything's possible. My experience is that Baptists are pretty typical, uh, you know, Bible Belt uh, Republicans. So, well, they were that too, but they had the ones I'm thinking of in particular had, you know, pretty interesting stuff that interested me that was seemed a little more on superstition side. But that's a that's another conversation altogether. Mm. So, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really kept up with the Baptist world, so. I wouldn't be surprised. I hear that they are, uh, you know, making some pretty big changes in terms of kind of going along with um, the more uh, liberal ecumenical route now, which is which is curious because uh, uh, Southern Baptists had, you know, for so long kind of opposed that stuff. Right. I, I haven't heard that. That's intriguing, actually. Very. I'm speaking of like Southern Baptist Convention kind of altering things, basically. So, so being so as a as an Orthodox Orthodox Catholic, was it? Well, we would say that we are. I mean, the East and the West for the first thousand years of the Church was roughly the same. Mm -hmm. and then you split between Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy happened around around ten fifty four official. So, okay. but they're they're different. So, what's, definitely. Oh yeah, totally. What's the relationship or um, how, how does the church feel about paranormal stuff and and 
that kind of thing. Fortiana. Well, like I was saying earlier, you know, the Orthodox tradition has quite a bit to say about, you know, dreams and prophecies and clairvoyance and all that. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty well known and, and believed in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, amongst a lot of Orthodox saints, but it's not something we don't make spiritual experiences like that our our guide no i was more on i was more look asking if like is it frowned upon to like be a ghost hunter if you're in or if you're in the if you're in the orthodoxy you know oh, like, oh, like that oh, kind of yeah. relation what's the relationship what yeah, yeah. Uh, generally speaking yeah um occultic practices would be frowned upon and forbidden. And that would be specifically things like sorcery, uh, uh, trying to contact the dead, um, uh, you know, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. would, would be forbidden, yes. So safe to say you've never performed any magic, like that ritual magic? <laughs> <laughs> Perform magic rituals? No, I'm, yeah. I'm not. I'm... Aside from the Catholics, you know, like lighting candles to saints. I'm sure. Yeah, aside from your religion. Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by, I mean, yeah, wh wh what do you mean by magic? What do you you've, mean by You've never practiced Enochian magic, Solomonic magic, or no, not at chaos all. magic, mix sigils. Well, <laughs> yeah. You probably, no, you, you actually, <laughs> you do use chaos magic day to day, but you just don't realize everyone does. <laughs> well, I'm saying like, like in Orthodox theology, we do believe in theurgy. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's an yeah. old, uh, yeah. It's an, a church father concept, which in our view, you know, that for example, the divine liturgy is a theurgic action. It's an action of falling down and, and participating in the divine energies, basically. So uh, in a sense, uh, you could call it, you know, true <laughs> divine magic, if, you, if that's what you mean. But if you mean, um, you know, do I want, am I going to call on uh, Asmodeus and try to get him to do my bidding to bring me uh bags of gold no that's, uh, that won't work out too well yeah well interesting no, i i wouldn't do that either i hear he's kind of a dick <laughs> well the, <laughs> the the keys of solomon and all that's kind of you know that's like renaissance era so <laughs> uh I, that in my mind calls into question the authenticity of it so so oh, even if one was there. going to try to practice the Solomonic magic, you know, this, this document from, you know, 1500s or something is not, that's not <laughs> Solomonic magic. Anything from the 1500s is questionable at this point. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to talk about that. I was thinking yesterday, I was listening to someone talk about, oh, it was, it was, uh, it was like the new THC episode with that, I forget the guy's name, Magnet, Mag, Mag, Magnora, I think, doesn't matter. He uh, was talking about Freemasonry and how they're, I guess, I don't know if it's the profane story they tell, but, it, you know, it's about rebuilding the Temple of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, there's some doubt whether there was ever, this is just, I'm just talking, not a question. Um, mm -hmm. If Solomon ever existed, if it was just, you know, a fantasy. And I started thinking about what if the Freemason, that story is actually a metaphor for, and the Temple of Solomon is, is, is your mind or your consciousness. So as you go up the Freemasonry ladder, you are improving and building upon your consciousness until it's perfect, which would be Solomon's Temple. Right. I mean, it's, it's interpreted in different ways. Sometimes it's interpreted as um, the, the great work in terms of mm -hmm. uh, perfecting all of life. Uh, sometimes it's interpreted as an individual psychological alchemical journey that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at times it's actually believed in as, uh, we need to support, you know, Zionists to actually rebuild right. the temple. So it, right. it, it's, it's utilized in a lot of different ways. And they're probably all the right ones too. <laughs> they're, they're, I'll take it advantage of, put it that way. What do you think about deja vu, Jay? Uh, it's uh, obviously I've had deja vu, but, um, I don't know. I, I tend to think at times, maybe it's, uh, remembering a dream that you had a prophetic dream. That's entirely possible. Um, or it's just the brain kind of processing it ahead of time. Um, but I don't believe in like 
uh, alternate universes or, or anything like that. When you've had deja vus, have you been able to pinpoint them to a dream you've had? Maybe once or twice, but but not anything consistently, no. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so if you don't believe in alternate universes, then your approach to, say, the alien contact that people are having is what, de demonic? I would say there could be multiple explanations for uh the alien alien ufo uh close encounter phenomenon and one of those could be yes um seeming contact with entities that are not actual extra biological entities but in fact spiritual entities mm -hmm. uh, i would say that my own uh drug trip bad trip um the many cases I've read of people who've who've had trips and drug experiences the history of, of shamanic religion for example, from uh, Merkia Iliata, the famous comparative religion scholar, you can read Carlos Castaneda. There seems to be a pretty consistent pattern of, of the same uh, experiences of what people think are the gods with the aliens. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that I think is possible there. Um, I think that there's also an aspect to which the, the similarities between ritual abuse and government experimentation could be a, a one angle on it which mm -hmm. is possible because the experiments or the, the experiences of the abductees seem to be pretty parallel to ritual abuse so i think there's something to that and that probably ties into um mk ultra to a degree as well this this is a, just my personal theory on it most most um, definitely ties into it and then uh but uh that's all i could can come up with that's as far as i believe i don't think that there are actual ets like extra biological no, I don't either. No, I'm just curious. There's a lot of uh, the, I would say the evangelicals would, you know, first of all, say, oh, it's de they're demons. Everything is demons. Everything is demons. Yeah, everything's demons in that view. And that's a kind of an oversimplification. Not everything is demons. Sometimes people are histrionic too, or that, you know. Sure, sure. And then sure. There's, there's sometimes things are fake. There's just complete, uh, completely concocted psychological operations. Like uh, I think one of the first, uh, alien uh, yeah, study and Barney. Yes, is directly from sci-fi. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Yeah, and I, I'm, I am a believer that Roswell was a staged incident of some sort. But just yeah, that's what I think. I think it was a psyop. You know? Yeah, totally. But look what look what it's wrought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, functions too perfectly for. Uh, a uh, military industrial complex uh, cover slash lie to you know have people chasing their tails forever. Yeah, it's just meanwhile wild. you can engage in a bunch of real, you know, R and D that relates to everything from surveillance to aerospace or whatever. Uh, are you familiar with the work of uh, Joshua Kutchin? Of who? Josh Kutchin. Uh, no, no. What a book called. Um... A, a Trojan Feast was his first book. Second one was called Brimstone Deceit. And his new one is called Thieves in the Night, where he's talking about the similarities, the very, very many similarities between fairy lore and the current UFO activities. Oh, okay. Um, actually, a couple, yeah, I've seen it. I haven't read that guy, but I've, uh, if you read uh, Yates's book, he, he actually talks about that. Yates has a book on. Uh... He talks about Yates in his book. Okay, yeah, I've read Yates on it, and then uh, I read Peter Labenda's book, and he, he his trilogy, uh, Sinister Forces, and he mm -hmm. kind of touches on that a little bit there. It's just, it's just interesting. I mean, I'm, I have no, I don't know either way. It's just it, it was an interesting book, interesting stories. Uh... Well, it seems to be parallel to the people who, for example, have the experience of the elves, uh, you know, doing DMT, um, mm -hmm. and it fits perfectly with my worldview i would say yeah absolutely those <clears throat> those entities are real um they're they're not physical in the sense of what we think of as in this dimension they may be invisible they may be sp physical in some sense but just invisible i don't know what their exact makeup is but yeah no it's uh, i'm not asking for that it's, i was just it's just right. an interesting thing to explore and no i think there's a definite Parallel, absolutely. I would agree. So, did Nish ask you this already? If you didn't, tell me to shut up. Uh, do you, so these entities, do you think they're local or non-local? Or, you know, is it part of our collective unconscious or conscious? Uh, I don't think that it 
makes sense really to talk about locale in, in terms of uh, higher dimensions or spiritual realities, which I do think are real. I, I think that they're not spatio-temporal in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, those entities can be present in a, in a special way in time and space. Um, but probably similar to the dreamscape, I don't think the spiritual realm is like over there you know what i mean it, sure sure it, it sure, sure. Be, but but um but uh, well okay so are you saying that the spiritual realm is part of this it's like overlaid you're saying or it is, is it, it is okay. exactly but and 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 there can be the the transference of locale can be done in a different way than than like moving spatially i don't know how but yeah, i'm well, saying i understand what you mean yeah, there's a, um, <clears throat> I wrote are actually some articles on this a long time ago that dealt with um, what mathematicians have said about uh, dimensional studies. I, mean, I don't mean, I don't mean that in the, in the woo-woo sense, I'm no, saying I... like actual mathematicians that talk about, you know, a tesseract or the higher right. level of uh, reality, that they seem to have these properties that are, uh, similar to geometric forms that we can roughly have an idea of an, a, maybe an analogy to, but we don't have a full picture of it. Um, it's all about the angles. Yeah. The, so they'll use like fractals and all that. Fractals are sometimes brought into that, but to more specifically like uh, certain crystals have the form geometric form um, of higher dimensions. Um, that's not, woo woo or conspiracy that's that's confirmed like uh, quasi crystals actually have a geometrical form which is the same of penrose tiling um, which is the same as a tesseract or a, a hypercube yeah. um, so we know mathematically even though we can't touch it or necessarily see it we know that the the next dimension up is has the just like our dimension has you know uh length 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 width depth etc right that's what it is to be 3d or 4d 5d is um a hypercube it's a tesseract and it has a specific ge geometrical form just like a 2d plane has a geometrical form but we can't um, visualize a hypercube we need to visualize its shadow correct yeah, yeah so in other is, words yeah. so in other words things can be are slippery <laughs> to use the uh description of certain uh, physicists like Lisa Randall. She speaks of it that way. With all this in mind, um, with dimensional realities and all that, what do you actually think dreaming mm -hmm. is? Be like I said, beyond the daily like is it, is it defragging. Brain? What do you think the process is? Is it, carry on, Jerry. No, I was going to say, like uh, brain function or travel, you know, something like that. Uh, I think that there is an inner world and an outer world, and both of these uh, are very real, and they do connect uh, in a certain way, metaphysically or ontologically. So when you dream, you are inside the inner universe that is you, uh, and it really is an entire landscape. Um, it has in some way a connection to the collective unconscious and the external world and everybody else's escapes i don't know how that is but it does um but i i believe that it is um it's not just an inner world of symbols i believe that it, it's an actual inner world it's it's real it's not real in the same sense as the the, the common reality that we all share so i'm not saying that I, I think there can be levels of things that are real levels of reality um, but your inner world of symbols, the inner architecture of your psyche and who you are, who it is to be you, your, your innermost man, your spirit is real. And it has a, a, uh, it has a lattice work. It has a structure to it. Um, and it plays out in the dream world. Um, but as to how exactly the phenomena in the dream are real and yet not real that's you know probably one of those mysteries that we won't ever know in this life i don't know but that's my suspicion with with that said how 
what do you think then the nature of waking life is? You, you cut out there, I didn't hear you. With, with all that kind of loosely defined, what do you think the nature of waking life is? Uh, I mean, I, I think that it is, um, I do believe in a real external physical world that's objective, that's common to all of us. Um, I believe that it, you know, has the dimensions and, and proportions that we see. And then, of course, I think there are higher dimensions as well. We talked about, uh, I don't know how many or how high they go. There's probably a whole bunch of dimensions. Um, uh, but. I, I, no, I, I mean, I don't really know what to say other than that the, the, the historical time-space world that we experience, I do believe, is, is absolutely real. In other words, I don't think like the external world and the waking state is an illusion, or I don't believe any of the, of the Far Eastern philosophy. Right. Well, we're, I mean, we're clearly having an experience that seems quite tangible. It's sure. same as within what we view as dreaming. Mm -hmm. where, where do you see? I don't know that I would say they're the same though. And I, and they're not the same. Yeah, I mean, clearly. Not, right. But I'm saying I, I, I would tend to say that the dream experience is the inner person, the, the, the inner world of the person working out not just the defragging that you talked about, but, but it is part of life. Actually. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain. It. I think that it, it demonstrates that we're more than just physical, that we do have a soul. I think dreams are a great Testament to that. That's where I wanted to go with, with setting this up. It, so you've, you've, um, you keep saying, you know, you keep identifying maybe our personas or, or, mm -hmm. um, ego state which is really a lower state than or underlies the personas um at least in a union sense where what do you think the soul is and how does that play out via these two realms that yeah. seem to be intertwined yeah I, I mean i think there are insights in carl Jung, um and i've read a decent amount of Carl, not a whole lot but a decent amount um but i also don't necessarily agree with all the, the Jungian stuff either because he tends to view things in a kind of Gnostic way um, and as Orthodox we have a specific kind of anthropology that we believe is true um, that we adhere to so there's well, we're interested in what you think so well I know but I'm Orthodox so I'm telling you yeah. that I believe yeah. I don't believe the the Jungian scheme in toto so um, <laughs> we believe that the soul is unique to the to the individual in that an individual doesn't have just a, soul, a body and a soul, but also a spirit. And we believe that the spirit is the highest faculty in man, mm -hmm. which uh, God gave uh, to us to, to know him directly. Um, so so the, the li life is a process of recovering that, what we call a noose, uh, and, and that, that's the faculty for knowing God directly. So that's kind of what the journey of life is, 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 uh, as some of the church fathers and, and mystics of the desert, for example, speak of remembering God. It's mm -hmm. almost like mankind has forgotten God in a way um, as one of the results of the fall. And so there is um, a remembering of God that occurs, uh, which is related to that inner journey that we were talking about. But it's not just, you know, an inner journey. There's also, you know, the external world and interacting with and, interact, and you know, loving other human beings as well. So in other words, that's my I, I also come from the perspective. Oops. Sorry, I think I roboted. I also come, I, I adhere to um, the spirit and the soul thing. And so it, it plays out a lot in my own personal work and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, I, and from my understanding of Jung as well, he spoke a lot about the difference between the two. I'm wondering what, your ideas or um, concepts of death are as tying into all of this is kind of a thread since we kind of, that's a point at which we get, right? We're kind of going towards, and, and, I, and so there's a lot of esoteric stuff you can wrap it around in whatever, mm -hmm. from whatever perspective you're coming from. But in general, what does, what is that? And, and do you see it playing out in your life through states of consciousness, such as dreaming or um, 
lucid, lucid moments within your daily life? Well, one thing I want to say is that um, when Carl Jung talks about uh, anima and the soul and spirit, um, he's kind of speaking of it in the platonic sense. And in, in our, in our anthropology, uh, we don't believe in the platonic view. So there might be aspects of Platonism where we agree in terms of like mathematical structure of the world or something like that, but we don't agree with the, uh, the platonic anthropology. So I wanted to make that clear to people that are listening. I'm not, I'm not advocating Platonism. Um, so we, we think that, that it's something different. Um, but as to it really, how it relates to death, could you, could you rephrase the question? You said, what does, what a daily experience is? Wait, so what are your concepts of, and your, your concepts and maybe your deeper understanding of what is death and what is its function or meaning in this larger process of, of oh. what we're going through? Well, I believe in the fall, um, and the Orthodox doctrine is different than the Western view of the fall of man. So we don't believe that uh, God is angry at uh, everybody because of what Adam did. Uh, we believe that Adam's sin introduced a state of being, which um, it has put man in a state of corruption. Um, but it has nothing to do with like we have to pay back, you know, the debt of original sin or something like this. That's not that's not the Orthodox view. So. Uh, so death is the introduction of um, spiritual and physical corruption and separation from God. And so this life is basically a kind of hospital to, to repair that uh, life in communion with God. So death is, in our view, um, not a bad thing, but actually a blessing because it's it's a necessary step on the restoration of human nature. So uh, death for us is uh, victory uh, over, uh, you know, the irony is that in our view, the very thing that, that Satan intended to enslave man with, uh, death, has actually become the thing that frees man. Uh, now, that doesn't, we don't mean that in a Gnostic sense, like the body is the source of man's problem. It's not. Morals are the source of man's problems. Uh, bad morals and and a bad heart, uh, not his physical body, uh, which which is why we believe in the resurrection. Uh, so unlike most or all Platonic or Gnostic type views, we actually believe that the body will be resurrected. So death is basically the stage uh, to where this body is more or less shed. Uh, the spirit goes on, and then eventually we believe that there will be a resurrection and the, and the body will be restored to kind of what was intended to be the case with Adam and Eve, but, but in an even greater sense. How do you see timelines like past, present, future, linear, linearity and causalities, causalities playing into, into all that? I also think I believe we don't die. But that's my own stuff. So I, I think death is an interesting concept to ponder. Well, I think the body dies, but I don't. I don't think that like our spirit right. Our I mean, is. clearly our body dies, but I mean, you know what I'm saying. Well, some people might say that's a loose too, but I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me clarify. I definitely think we shed the skin. A lot of people the, will say it's an illusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we do. Well, shed listen the to my binaural beats, and you'll be <laughs> regrow your body. <laughs> that's too woo woo for me, actually. <laughs> but in, anyway, yeah, so um what was your question again? I actually forgot in all that. It was good too. Um geez. Man. Oh, linear uh past oh. present linear realities and causalities through that. So looking at being born, going through life, and then dying. But when you were talking about the resurrection and the, the way you presented that information um, brought this question up, like how do you see the way we perceive time playing into all that? Um, I, I, I don't believe in cyclical time. Um, that's more of a, a pagan view. I believe that there is beginning, middle, and end. Uh, both to our lives and to history as well. Um, but of course, end doesn't mean that it stops. It means that it moves into uh, like a higher state of being. Um, so in our view, all of reality will be transfigured uh, in, 
in the the eternal state. Um, but we don't believe that the eternal state will necessarily be a whole lot different than it is now. Um, there will still be uh, a universe. There will still be planets. There will still be people. There will still be Earth. Um, you know, cities. All the, all the things that we're used to will still exist because we still have uh, physical bodies and physicality. That's not something that's done away with. But um, as to causality, uh, I, I don't know that I believe anything strange or out of a sorts with what most people think of causality being do you mean like can we can we affect causes uh in like back in time like back to the future or something what do you mean? yeah yeah and so that would bring in i mean you already mentioned you, you don't subscribe no, don't, to don't multiverse so. and all that but when we start talking dimensional stuff and then free will to to some extent and um you know, do you think, is there like a predestiny in your, in your view of things? Uh, well, one thing about Orthodox theology is that we don't tend to believe in um, <clears throat> any kind of dialectical tensions. So, for mm -hmm. example, we don't put a, a tension between um, the sovereignty of God and the will of man. So, for us, God is both sovereign and at the same time, man has free will. And so, we actually just accept the fact that uh, that is mysterious and we'll never actually understand how, how mm -hmm. is it that God is, uh, uh, you know, all knowing and at the same time, we still freely make decisions that we're, we're culpable for. I don't know. And I don't know that anybody is ever, but that's, uh, that's actually a, a problem for anybody. So it's, it's sometimes yeah. people say, Oh, well, that's a problem for you theists. <laughs> actually, that's a, that's a conundrum <laughs> for anybody. It doesn't matter what, even if you're an atheist and you think that, you know, the atheist has the exact same issues of, how is is there uh, how does the individual atheist if he's just a determined part of chemical reactions how is he culpable or how does he deserve any praise for his actions uh if he's just chemical reactions right? in other words it assumes that you freely you know did a b c yeah um so uh that's a good question i mean these are you're asking some pretty heavy but to basically we're compatible <laughs> with the, the philosophical language of a predestination free free will were compatibilists. In okay, and then so wrapping this into dream realm again, is it do you see and I I feel like you answered this question. I just I guess I want clarity on mm -hmm. it. Um are you able to are you able to access a a one on one or I don't know so I'm looking at it through your orthodoxy how does the dream world communicate with you like are you able to actually have a direct access to god through dreams or how does that well, work we would say that the direct access to god is something that we strive for at all times so it doesn't really have anything to do with the dream state per se i mean god could certainly speak to us at any time that he wants to, and I think God does speak to us at all times, mm -hmm. uh, if we are paying attention, if we are, you know, in the right frame of mind. But it doesn't necessarily have any special relationship to the dream state per se. Um, if you read our, for example, there's the, what's called the Philokalia, which is a classical uh, work from Orthodox mysticism. And spirituality and i'm actually familiar with it okay well, there's there's uh not a tremendous amount but but dreams uh, are mentioned there uh, many spiritual writers in our tradition you know talk about dreams and really not much more is said than than what i've said so far in other words um we're not charismatics in the sense of like you know the evangelical charismatics uh, but we also don't deny you know the reality of miracles we think that all these things are, are very real and very possible so uh prophetic dreams visions these kinds of things do happen but we also sort of test them against the uh the tradition as a whole so in other words like if i had a vision you, you, well take mormonism for example you know for us that's immediately canceled out i mean there's no new revelation that god's going to give some goofball con man you know uh, 
in 17, whatever, uh, to know that there's like a new way to follow God, right? That we would immediately just cross that off. Um, cause it's, it's a complete violation of the, of the, of our tradition as a whole. So, uh, for us, tradition is a good thing and it's a rule and a guide to, on the one hand, uh, still allow for, uh, spiritual experiences or dreams or visions. And at the same time to not be uh, misled by those things. So that's maybe that's not the kind of answer you were looking for, but, um, in other words, uh, no, it, just to be simple, the dream state doesn't necessarily have a special relationship to how one would contact or speak to God per se. Okay. Yeah. And there's, I'm not, I actually, I'm really open. So I'm not, I don't have like an idea of what I'm looking for, but I want to get into a, a, a couple things, um, a couple things in, in the dreams themselves. Have you, do you, have you experienced what i mean everyone has but water dreams like the ones that seem like deep water or where the water where you're in there with maybe they seem a little bit alarming or not pleasant hmm actually not that i can think of um I, I'm sure that at some point in my dream history, there there was ocean or lake or water. Yeah, the deep water. But in the abyss. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not, not that I can. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I've always enjoyed the ocean. You know, I've always I learned to swim at a young age, so it's never been anything that was like. Uh, you know, some people are deathly afraid of the ocean and you know, it's like a weird fear of their phobia or something i don't have any any fears or uh, anything like that um i'm actually moving <laughs> by the ocean so i'm very pro ocean um uh, yeah what about I, I could give you more but no i can't think of anything to do with with water. no that's that's all right it's great um what about animals in your dreams And in particular, maybe some of your own animals you've been around or cared for in the past, those are even more important. Uh, yeah, maybe like a family dog or cat has popped up every now and then in a dream, but not... Nothing that three, pops out. Three. Most of the time, my dreams are, I am on some long journey across the U.S., or I am in some giant strange hotel facility with all of these doors and, and secret passages and, and secret basements and hidden doorways and or I'm I'm on some sort of mountain trek and it's it's almost always some kind of long hero quest type thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah that's what those sound like. Most of the what time too uh they uh and I, I'm not a big video game player, but a lot of my dreams, oddly enough, they seem like video games. They seem like, um, you know, you've got to make it through this, uh, say, stage and you've got a gun and you've got to like, you know, laser blast all of these Jawas and Wookiees or something. <laughs> I mean, I actually, I did have a, a, a dream very similar to that recently. Where it, uh, <laughs> Do you play like Star a, Truck Star Wars Online? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I don't play any any kind of games like that, really. Um, oh, can you share this one with us? The dream? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, I, and I. This was probably because uh, of writing the second book and and thinking about the Matrix. Um, I actually had a, we were talking about on a couple podcasts the uh, that they're building Star Wars World. Um. At Disney, I dreamt I dreamt that uh, the experience of Star Wars World was actually that you go and you kind of link up to a matrix, like you lay in a pod and they they hook the thing in the back of your your neck and and you literally enter into um, a virtual video game scenario. Um, and I, it was uh, like the Moss Eisley Cantina and everyone was shooting lasers and you know this kind of stuff. So it was a very vivid dream. Um, you know, it was a very uh, realistic battle sequence. Um, and that's that's all that stands out in that dream. But but um, 
most of the time my dreams are that kind of stuff where it's like, you know, I'm going to be, uh, you know, going on some big TV show and I get, I get to meet uh, Jerry Seinfeld or something like that. It's one of those two types of dreams. Yeah. What about, <clears throat> what about specifically uh, people that have passed that you know? Like outside of the dream you gave us where um, you woke up knowing that that person had passed, but what about people that have already passed that are connected to you somehow in this life? Yeah, I had one very elaborate dream where I met Gary Cooper um, and he took me on a flight path showing me like, you know, cause I think he did fly a, a plane or something like he was involved in. Or it was part, or it was in the movie. I, I can't remember, but there was something to do with flying with Gary Cooper in a in a um, um, a war sequence that was very vivid. And I remember asking him, I said, "You, you know, you, you passed away, right? <laughs> like you're not alive." And it was <laughs> sort of a weird kind of no. Oh, I'm perfectly alive. Uh, that way, we, I, re, I vividly remember that that conversation. So, um, that was a weird one. How real did that feel? Like how lucid did it feel? Very. All, all my dreams are extremely. Okay, so, so yeah, you've reiterated that. I guess I, I'm always asking just to see if there's a. It's any... just like you know that that I consider an experience that you had. Regardless of if it was in a dream or not, it's, it was completely real to you. Yes. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's just I'm not I'm not even a huge I don't even care about Gary Cooper. I don't you know I I mean did he did he was he in some kind of like uh, World War Two movies or something? Oh, I'm sure. That, but that is more significant to me that it, and gives it a little more poignance that you know. You're not like an avid fan. You don't know his whole. No, I don't care anything about. You know his exactly. So that it, that's why it's more interesting. Yeah. As exactly. a dream. Yes, he was in Mr. Deeds. So I mean, he was in a lot of movies and a lot of war movies, but he was active. Okay. Okay. Up Makes until sense. Uh, fifty-two. What was that one? He was up and he was uh, active until nineteen fifty-two. And he even starred in silent films. Oh, yeah, wow. he was—he goes way back. Right. Well, I've got—I want to ask you a couple woo-woo questions, so don't bear with me. And it's, it's just—it's just—it's sure. um, good fodder. Um, so, what do you think about the whole? Um, I'm expecting these to be interesting from you, by the way, Jay. Since I—I I do listen to your to your presence in the world. Um, okay. What do you think about the whole moon landing situation in space? Uh, we did a boiler room last week, actually, where we covered this. So, uh, oh, I missed that. Yeah, if you listen to last week's boiler room, I think we spent about I don't know thirty minutes talking about the moon. Um, I, I'm a moon skeptic. I don't I don't claim to know exactly what aerospace technology we do have. I do believe that lower space, you know satellites and all that I, I tend to think that's real um but i'm I'm skeptical about whether we went to the moon uh, and i don't find the evidence that's out there convincing um but i'm not a, a flat earther or anything like that it's funny a lot of times people will make that same like um you know the, the they're health, healthily skeptical yeah of the moon, but they have to separate themselves from the flat earther thing. And, and I, yeah, I think that's been done on purpose. You know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's also the whole flat earth movement has been really connected to the evangelical movements too. It's, it's the way it got polluted or I don't even know what it, if that was its intent all along to just discredit by inclusion. <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah, right. We're not, we're not flat earthers either. Yeah, that's usually how the system does things is they toxify something and then, then they just try to associate everybody that they don't find favorable with the thing that they toxified. That's a kind of a classic, you know, totally. counterintelligence. Totally. Counterintelligence thing. <laughs> it's funny too because the uh some of the actors out there, I would say, are would incorporate into their story other actors who are unverifiable. For instance, like the QAnon stuff. 
which you're mm-hmm. familiar with, right? And mm-hmm. you know who David Wilcock is? Yeah. Okay, so, like, they adopted QAnon as part of their side. You know, that he's telling truth, you know, and he's on our side. That kind of shit. It's like uh-huh. the, the echo chamber builds upon itself. It's pretty funny. Right. Yeah, no, I, I pretty quickly uh, was uh, skeptical of, of Q, and, uh, like, I think about a week or two after it began, I made a, uh, a video that I remember that uh, was uh, anti Q. So <laughs> I haven't I haven't followed it. I know it's continued going. But, I haven't either. Um, it's yeah, it's still going, but it, it's they're crazed. They're it's a crazed lot. It's just more divisiveness in in the public. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. And so also in this will kind of shifting over to another sector uh-huh. what do you and we talked we touched on it earlier but what do you think all this kind of hoopla about antarctica and again of course you don't know but i mean what do you think um, about possible read, read, old I, technology all that stuff oh uh, eh, i'm probably skeptical about that I, I i haven't followed it closely but i did actually dig up uh when I was a research assistant, um, some old archive uh, material that did vindicate that there was a Nazi base there. That's actually true. Yeah. I'm not saying I'm not saying that Hitler like st- is still hanging out there, and, like you know, eating ice sickles, ice pops, or something. But um, I don't believe that. But but uh, there was a, a a Nazi base there. Um, beyond that, I don't really. I can't really say any more than than that um it's it's definitely um closed off for research purposes but that probably relates to you know stuff to do with like surveillance and satellites and and uh that kind of stuff geopolitical type stuff i don't think it relates to flat earth or aliens or underground bases per se i mean there could be an underground base i think the nazi base was supposedly underground um if i recall but that was a, a um, historical piece that I dug up probably about 2013 and I'll never find it again. But when you, if you're a research assistant assistant, you'll have access to a lot of stuff in a university that, um, you don't have when you're outside the university. So, um, they kind of keep the information gated off actually. Um, so I, I do miss the days when I had access to JSTOR and basically all of the, the research hubs. That was a, a nice some, time. So audit some classes. <laughs> uh, no, I hate, I hate, I hate academia. Oh, I, yeah. I left, I left it because I can't stand it. Ditto. What? So, okay. And then moving from, so from the moon to Antarctica to, to get a Trinity on this deep water underwater, as far as, we know we haven't explored the depths. Do you think there's possibility of something going on down there that people may be calling alien, but it's actually not because it's here? So uh, I don't know. I really don't. Um, I figure that there are probably uh underwater bases you know that the navy that the, the navy has and whatnot um they probably have you know fancy aerospace tech that can <laughs> fly out of the water and up you know back into the water that that probably exists that doesn't seem implausible but as to strange creatures you know strange creatures are discovered all the time that relate to uh you know extreme depths Oh yeah, yeah. So, but alien life? No, I don't. I don't think that there's. Well, if I mean, if you think about it, if somebody sees, say, our tech that's underwater that can rise up out of the water and fly, mm-hmm. that could easily create a big hoopla of speculation that would immediately lead to all or kinds you, of. Could there be like a hidden civilization underwater? Yeah, or maybe something like that. Like, where are you with the timeline as far as, there's a lot of talk about this right now, like as far as how old things really are. Is it possible there's an older older civilizations under the waters? Um, Even it, under the ground too. I mean, just like 
is our timeline of oh, is it uh, under, I think that there there are probably very large underground areas. I'm skeptical that there's like a civilization there. It would be it would be neat, but you know what you about know, past civilization type stuff? I don't, I don't uh, say what. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What about past civilizations like? Atlantis, Lemuria, those kind of things. What are your thoughts on that? I think there was uh, an Atlantis. You know, mm -hmm. Plato talks about it. Uh, right. I, don't, I don't think they had saucers and stuff. They weren't floating around, but I think there was an Atlantis. I think it's possible that ancient civilizations might have had high technology. I hold that out as a possibility, but, you know, it's just in the realm of, like, fun speculation. I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily certain, but... Uh, I doubt they had computers it's like we do, like digital. I don't think they had digital technology. Mm -hmm. I would imagine they had more natural tools be, yeah. that, you know, vibration, frequency kind of shit, like Coral Castle kind of stuff to make the pyramids. Yada, yada, those kind of things. Um, well, Plato, when Plato talks about Atlantis, he doesn't describe it as like magical. You know, he describes it as a place and it, uh, you know, it collapsed of, because of its kind of form of government or whatever Plato says about it in two or three of the uh, mm -hmm. dialogues. Mm -hmm. I think it's in the Crido and it's in the Timaeus, I think. Um, but uh, I do hold out certain possibilities for those kinds of, for, for example, in the Phaedo, um, there's a really interesting section where Socrates talks about uh, that there are hidden civilizations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, so, I don't know that anybody exactly knows what he means or what he's talking about. But what he says is that there are caves and rocks and hollows in the earth that do lead to civilization. Um, that is in the Phaedo, and in mm -hmm. fact, actually, certain online publications of of it have excised that. So you actually have to look at, like, I have, <laughs> I think, the 1950s uh, Jewett uh, translation of Plato. Mm. And in my copy of the Phaedo, it's, it's there. He says that at the end, you might say, well, so what? You know, he was just speculating on some ancient guy. Well, the, the weird part is that he says that there are other colors on the color spectrum that we don't even know about. And it's only been modern science that has actually confirmed that there are other colors on the color, color spectrum. So um, there's a whole bunch of interesting things in Plato's uh, dialogues that for example the platonic solids and the structure of things like molecules and whatnot um there's no way that, that they could have known that uh to my knowledge that has never been explained to my knowledge it's never been explained and in fact i i've never heard anybody talk about it until i went and read the, the Phaedo and did talks on plato lectures three years ago i've never heard anybody talk about this like what what is what is Socrates talking about when he talks about there being other colors on the color spectrum? Nobody knows. <laughs> so on right, the one hand, just blame him for being drunk or something. Oh, he he was out of his mind when he wrote. It. Yeah, but that's a pretty precise thing to say. I mean, no, I understand. There's a and, lot and, of and yeah. the fact that he, they were also inducted into Pythagorean mysteries, and so they knew about you know, the, the geometric structure of reality down to the smallest level of, of how things are put together is also, you know, they didn't have, to, they didn't have microscopes. They didn't know that. So, right. You know, that's some, that's some really fascinating stuff that makes me think, well, it could be that there were, uh, you know, you know, we don't know what life was like before. For example, I believe in the flood. I believe Genesis six is describing historical events. Genesis eight, you know, we don't know what the world was like. It could have been very different back then. You know, during that time period, there could have easily been uh, during the period of Noah, you know, something like uh, Atlantis. You know, mm. we don't know. So on the one hand, I understand the, the skepticism and I try to be skeptical. But I also, on the other hand, know that when it comes to academia, a lot of these academics, they don't know anything and they pretend to know. So there's a lot more that we don't know than we do know. And that, I think. You know, some people call me crazy, but how come I read Plato scholars all through college and grad school? Nobody ever talked about that that aspect of the Phaedo. Well, probably, one of the they friends don't they don't have an answer to that. They just don't fucking know. Yeah. There's there's one all... of the f... Go ahead. One of the friends of our show, Robert Powell, talks about this at 
it extensively. And um, actually, a lot of what you've been talking about reminds me of Robert, who's a scholar. He talks um, about what? Uh, all this stuff with the the Plato and the Plato, Plato and the colors, and like he's deep into that, and he's also, I believe, on the same. Uh, I think it's I consider it esoteric Christian path. I don't have the P's and Q's right here and at the t- tip of my tongue, but I just wanted to say I have heard him talking about this stuff. Okay. Well, I mean, I, and I'm not saying that I believe the Earth is hollow. I'm saying I don't know, but right. it's interesting. Socrates said that. Right. And nobody ever talks about that. Why? It's interesting. I, I'm wondering if it's starting to come to surface more with more people digging, going back and, and revisiting those works now. Like I'm talking yeah, about re- real recently, like pretty much in this modern experience in the last couple years. Well, yeah, because of the internet, because of the ability to, uh, for a lot of people to exchange information in a way that was never possible before. Right. So you could, you could, uh, you could have that aspect, not necessarily covered up, but you could just not talk about it. You know what I mean? Like if you're, you could have professors for the last 300 years in universities teaching Plato and they don't, they don't know. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> right. They just don't know. It's, I mean, there, there's a lot that we don't know. This is one thing that I learned in academia that was good was that, you're given the impression maybe before you go into the academic world that, Oh, that man, they've got, they've got it figured out. They know their stuff there. And then when you go, what you learn is that actually what they've got figured out is some super precise niche in some single discipline Mm -hmm. and they don't know anything else. They, They might know everything about, I don't know, like, um, Christopher Columbus's, uh, you know, one diary that he wrote some guy spends his whole life writing his dissertation on that thing and he doesn't know anything else and that's what you tend to find in academia is that they're hyper specialized they don't know anything else about anything else and so they can't make connections between disciplines and they're more or less worthless as Mm -hmm. because i'm not saying that it's worthless to study you know christopher columbus's diary or whatever but but if you know everything about that and nothing about anything else you're not worth a whole lot really it's not like the classical education system where it did no it, yeah it, you got it. a well-rounded you yeah. know view of everything and all of it was in depth actually but modern education is designed to keep you from making connections that's the mm-hmm. point. i wholeheartedly agree it's, it's the nightmare it, of specialization right. and we're seeing it play out and then like the polar opposite of that is compartmentalization right business side it's crazy i forgot what i was going to say yeah, you're not supposed to make any connections, say, between uh, geometry and biology. Right, 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 right because it's different, different science. You're not supposed to say, hey, why does it look like it has mathematical structure everywhere? You're not supposed to say that. Like, you know. One of the things you talk about, Heresy. Um, the Phaedo talking about, uh, I forgot what it was now. Whatever you just said, why don't, why, the spectrums of light, that's what it was. I apologize. Mm-hmm. Um, certain, uh, the Dogons have left symbology that rep- that seems to represent atomic structure and things like that mm-hmm. and you could go back and say well how did they how do they know that it's the same kind of thing yes uh, i actually watched a ted talk by a guy who uh, i don't and i'm not trying to be obscure i just don't remember the title of it but something to do with um he's he's a mathematician who studied the uh, geometrical patterns and structure and structures of um the artwork of some African tribe. Uh, and he concluded that it had such complex patterns that um, the, the mathematics behind those patterns uh, pointed to like high level calculus and stuff like that. Now, I don't think that obviously the, the tribe had no idea what calculus was, but his point was that there was some consciousness in the, the, the tribe's artistic, their artisans or whatever, that was able to tap into mathematical patterns and principles that were pretty high order. Again, they didn't know. I mean, this we see this all the time in in, our, in artists across the board. Most artists don't give a damn about calculus, but they can sometimes present very, you know, intricate 
patterns that utilize high mathematical principles. You know, MC Escher's art is this way. I don't know that maybe Escher was a high level mathematician, but most of the time people ha are divided across either the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere of the brain. So most of the time, if people are highly gifted in right, <clears throat> right hemisphere and they're artistic, they're, they don't care about calculus. So, um, yes, there is something to this notion of tapping into uh, higher order principles, even if you don't necessarily know how to explicate it in a systematic way, logically, or at, in an abstract way, you can formulate it in a physical way through the art. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like a, a knowledge base that we can connect to when we are able to, and then you get that information in a way that you can understand. I think that, that math guy was Ron Eglash. He's an uh, ethno mathematician studies uh, that the, might be it. the way math and cultures intersect. If he does a talk on uh, African tribal art, TED Talk, then that's probably him. He's ta is the one I looked up just now is about um, fractal. That yeah. sounds like it. It was fractal patterns in the layout of the, the housing. The villages, that's yeah. That's it. Yeah, that looks pretty interesting. It is very fascinating. Um, and then I would also recommend... Uh, there's a <clears throat> fascinating talk by Jason Lyle, L-I-S-L-E, uh, about fractals in nature. His talk is really good. He's got two or three talks that are, that are on that. I have enjoyed uh, those. Yeah, he does information science, and he looks at uh, fractals in nature. Um, so we know that when you start down that path, what you start to realize is that there's obviously a connecting bridge between the mathematical forms that we have in our mind, uh, the mental scape, you could say, uh, and the patterns that are out there in nature. Uh, it could, because if there weren't, then it wouldn't work. You couldn't do mathematics from your mind and build bridges based on these principles, but you can't. So obviously there's a bridge between the abstract uh, conceptual entities and what we do out there in the external world. And that means that the external world is not chaotic, but it actually does have structure and it operates on, on principle. Hence it's designed. I was just going to say that. I was going to say, how can you escape the a designed universe? Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. very, very obvious. That you come from this perspective. All right. I'm looking for questions from the audience. Did you ask already, Chair? Of course. All right. You know, I don't look at the chat. Oswald has a question. Um, what do you think about... Well, by the way, mm. by the way, real quick before you sure. ask, I'm sorry, but it reminded me, his, uh, this uh, talk on uh, African uh, those designs and practicals, it, it reminded me of um, my essay on The Shining that's in, in my book. Uh, I had come across a really fascinating... Uh, a guy who analyzed the patterns of a one of the tribes near Australia, like an island off of Australia. Uh, and he looked at all of the artwork that they did on the backs of turtles. Like they would take a turtle shell and draw this artwork. Uh, and he found the exact same thing, that they had these very intricate labyrinth patterns. And so the labyrinth, obviously, in The Shining is a big part of the story. So what I did was I, I looked at... <clears throat> um, the journey uh, of the soul after death, as according to this tribe, it wasn't Dogon, it was some, but um, in the way they, they structured the labyrinth that they drew uh, mathematically. And it's, it's amazing, it's fascinating. And what you see is that, again, this is another example of this very intricate uh, mathematical pattern that this tribe that has no knowledge of mathematics you know, can, can explicate in their, their artwork. Yeah, that, that stuff deeply fascinates me because of its appearance out of context to how we would mm -hmm. view it in this society. I, I meant, it's funny you just said that because earlier, and I, I see I wrote a, wrote a note here, I wanted to get your idea on the Aboriginal, Australian Aboriginal idea of dream time. Like from your perspective, what do you think is going on with that? Uh, I'm not familiar with, with the Aboriginal perspective with, on Dreamtime. Enlighten me. Oh, 
Wow, Jay, I'm surprised. Um, the Aborigines of Australia have a thing they call dream time, and it's it's ancient and been it's oral process, but it's also something they participate in because it's real. Um, uh, it's basically ties into their everyday mythos and their creation mm -hmm. myths, and um, but the dream time is as real as this. And oh, okay. Somebody brought this up. Uh, pretty aware, but um, I don't know. I was on a show or something, and somebody was saying, "What do you think about the the view that the dream time is just as relevant and real as the waking time?" I think is what the way they asked it. Mm. Interesting. That's that's one of our questions usually. <laughs> yeah, wait. When you were when you were in the bathroom earlier, Jerry, I, I actually. It. Oh. Got that, yeah, where we tied those in. No, so the, the, the Aboriginal dream time is more of a unity space where everyone dreams together to, you know, it's their worldview that there's this, it's almost like um, a night world. Or, I can't even explain it right because I don't understand it that well. But it's, it's the, I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a thing that was here and mm -hmm. everyone was in dream time and then now I, they're in this realm and they're going to go back to dream time. So it's more like uh, a yuga concept. Hmm. Yeah. I've never found a way to actually simplify what oh, it is. Either. It's it's kind of complex, but and so it, it, people that have looked into it a little bit then kind of understand. So that I mean that answered itself. They called it the so, everyone. Yeah. Hmm. Cuz it's uh, It's fascinating stuff though, Jay. It's very fascinating. Okay. Yeah, I'll have to uh have to take a look at that. So Sorry. back to your questions, okay. Jer. I gotta find it. Oh, we got my control questions. Are sure you get happy about that? Um, okay, what did you... Uh, by Oswald. What do you think about near-term human extinction and or climate change? Uh, I believe that it's a scam. I do, I do a uh, globalist book series, mm -hmm. which is a series of lectures on writings from the top globalists and social engineers, strategists, planners, et cetera, technocrats. This is everybody from H.G. Uh, Wells to Bertrand Russell to Zbigniew Brzezinski to Jacques Attali uh, to Miles Copeland, the CIA, uh, you know, a pretty diverse group of globalists. Um, and I think it's pretty open and shut case that uh, climate change and uh, as it was previous global warming right. is a big linchpin in uh, in their strategy and it's uh, a complete hoax complete scam that's right it's a scarcity play for carbon okay um what do you think about east salem institute and tavistock and social engineering i know you got a lot to say about that on, uh, <laughs> no. on both of those and uh i think you could you could look at esalen as the the brain behind the 60s counterculture in many ways. So it's a lot of the cultural changing people. You could look at Stanford Research, uh, Changing Images of Man. You could look at uh, uh, Avistock is also kind of the UK version of that as well as MK Ultra and social engineering, uh, the, the preeminent places for so learning social engineering. Um, so, but yeah, if you, I would just say, <coughs> excuse me, Somebody who wants more specifically on that, I have a specific talk on Tavistock that's uh, it's had ten or twenty thousand views. I will. Uh, I'll put that link in the, in the show notes. So, uh, what do you think about the relationship? Or, uh, I don't know what it says. How much of theosophy has been carried over towards that work, or, or led into it? If Quite any. a bit. I mean, yeah. there's um, you know a lot of the people who were preeminent at the Esalen Institute and still are. Uh, were into theosophy and they, mm -hmm. they saw it as, uh, you know, maybe one of the contenders for how to create a universal mind, a universal consciousness, kind of a global religion type thing. In fact, I was just now reading in the sec uh, second half of H.G. Uh, Wells' uh, New World Order book where he talks about um, creating a cult. He says maybe a giant global cult could be the real way to bring in the New World Order. It's literally what he says. So um, I did a talk, for example, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, on uh, Marilyn Ferguson's um, uh, pretty famous book, uh, Acquiring Conspiracy. And she's really echoing the, the, the line of Esalen there in that book and, and 
the book Aquarian Conspiracy is not a conspiracy book. It's actually, she's actually for it. She's like, yes, we're here to create this, uh, you know, global consciousness, this, this new world order. It's going to be, you know, hopefully centered around new age religion, changing all the, the institutions and so forth, blah, blah, blah. So I have a, a whole talk I did on uh, Marilyn Ferguson's book that's very relevant. Um, but I already forgot what was the question. <laughs> I forgot to. Oh, it was, it was like eight questions in one. You should see the next one I got, which I rejected. <laughs> Something about global religion or Esalen, I forgot what it was. Uh, it was, what do you think about them? Tavistock, social engineering. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You covered it. And then yeah, the there's talks actually on both of those. There's talk, there's a, I would direct that person to the Marilyn Ferguson talk mm -hmm. uh, that I did and the, the, the Tavistock talk. Okay, I got the notes. All right. All right, that's it. So um, did you, did you um, initially said you had a new book out or coming out? Well, yeah, that? it'll be out. I just finished it uh, a couple days ago. It's Esoteric Hollywood 2, so it's the, mm -hmm. the sequel to the first book. It's going to be organized a little different than the first book, which was kind of centered around directors. So the you know, first book was a lot of Spielberg, a lot of Hitchcock, a lot of Kubrick. Um, and this time around, it's more centered around themes. So it begins with Hollywood and the mafia um, and espionage and spies and terror. And then it moves um, to MK Ultra and cults in relationship to film. And then it moves to uh, geoengineering, actually, mm -hmm. and how this has been presented in, in film. And then it moves to uh, transhumanism in film. So it's, it's going to be a little different. I'm, I'm kind of. Um, stepping out on a limb a little bit to do it, to, to risk doing it a little different, to try a different approach. Um, and hopefully there will be a trilogy. That's the goal. So oh, yeah. it'll be out hopefully for sale in the next few months. Great. Is it going to be through Amazon or on your own site or Lulu or something? Is there somewhere uh, I could link to it to tell people to watch for it? Say what now? Is there some place I could link to to tell people to watch for it? Other than oh, like your well, website, I mean, uh, there's pre order already on Amazon, okay. but because uh, it, it is traditionally published. So, uh, my publisher is Trine Day, that does you know quite a bit of uh, suppressed shadow government type uh, books. <laughs> um, and uh, it'll be the same publisher, Trine Day, but um, okay, I'll find it. But preferably, yeah, people could would get it if they, if they would get it from me, it's better because Amazon, you know, it's not that great for authors. No, I know. Plus, you could sign it. Exactly. That's the <laughs> pro, is it? So, when you pick your subject, like your first book, you obviously focused on directors and, and their work, their body of work, talking about the, the, that, the patterns you found in there. And the new one is based on a topic, right? Like, geo, like you said, geoengineering mm -hmm. and whatnot. Um, I kind of well, answer my own question. <laughs> well, I really didn't know how to do it. I mean, it was kind of a challenge because I had all these film essays that I'd written that were kind of popular and were getting shared a lot. And then I got asked if I had a manuscript and, and I was like, yeah, I guess, but I don't, you know, so I had to come up with how to organize it. And the best that I could come up with was, well, do a Kubrick section and then do a Spielberg section and then do uh, like an 80s, 70s and 80s section and then do um, Hitchcock and then do David Lynch and that was the best I could come up with was just kind of roughly directors and then I thought well there's hundreds and hundreds of essays that I wrote and I don't know how to <laughs> so I, I didn't want to keep on with directors because it was like well I could do a Scorsese section but that would not be wouldn't be as big so I just chose thematic sections for the for the second book no, I, I'm not saying it's wrong. It's great. I think it's fantastic. I was just curious what, I was going to ask where, you know, what thread did you pull on that led you in that direction? So, you know, what, I know, I know you're, you know, you've seen Kubrick movies, you've seen mm -hmm. David Lynch movies and, and shows and whatnot. So you know those things. Did you recognize the, the aspects you were going to write about before that idea to write the book came about? You know what I mean? Were you seeing this already yes. before? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it was like long ago. Well, I say long, like 10 years ago when I was 
trying to finish undergrad. I had some classes that were pretty interesting that uh, compared film with literature. Um, so that was a really neat class I had that was kind of formative for this. And I remember reading uh, some stuff about Oliver Stone commenting on film, and it actually had quite a bit of an impact on me. I remember <clears throat> I read some interviews that he did where he talked about the tie-in between his films and what was really going on you know for example in the cia with uh jfk and mcnamara and that kind of stuff and, um and i remember certain scenes that he put in the film where he for example in his nixon film he has at one point i think it's i think it's mcnamara at cia uh, starts quoting wb yates and the the poem about the beast and I remember being struck by that, how like, whoa, you know, and, and I don't, I think it's in, in like the, the director's cut of Nixon. And I remember like, whoa, that's crazy that he's got, you know, like the CIA guy reciting this, you know, occultic poem. Did that really um, happen? I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, no, I wouldn't either. But I mean, but I've heard uh, a lot of I'm things. Not, in, not to my, no, I think I would guess that Oliver Stone put that in there to, you know, portray him as a dark figure um yeah i'm sure the truth of it is not what we know yeah. yeah but um no, that's cool anyway that that stuck out from that class as something that was very neat um and then i had another class that was related to oliver stone where basically we just did stone films and um so the the idea stuck with me that that you could actually just write on the relationship between movies and reality. Mm -hmm. So that's what I started blogging on. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't actually focus on that. I wrote about a whole bunch of other stuff, but people are more interested in movies than they are philosophy. So, you know, I tried to really just kind of blend all of the arenas that I'm interested in together. And, you know, that's what the first book came out to be. It was just a collection of the essays that I felt made sense to go together. And then that's, you know, kind of what the second book's going to be, but, but you're right. It's been a, it's been an adventure in the sense that I didn't really know how to, to structure it. And it just kind of fell into place. Oh, that's cool. I think, um, I think I would, I would call this like, you're basically doing synchromistic work in a way. Yes. To a degree. Yeah. yeah. But there's also, you know, like an academic aspect to it too. So for example, of course. it's not like vigilant citizen where it's like, oh, here's an eye, here's a pyramid, therefore conspiracy. No, there's actually, you know, 404 footnotes in the first book. Like it's a lot of, it was a lot of research, a lot of reading, a lot of digging. Yeah, um, that's what's super impressive, yeah, by the way. Extremely well, thank you. And, and it's also a lot of right brain stuff where you're trying to write in a way that's entertaining and engaging and prosaic and funny at the same time. I always, one of the things I look for immediately is footnotes to see, you know, mm -hmm. where is all this resting and how much research, you know, that's always your cue. And um, I don't know, immediately upon seeing that in that book, I, um, you, you powered up for me. Let me put it that way. Oh, <laughs> yeah. What do you, uh, do you have any thoughts on Michael Crichton? Actually, yeah, we, I think I was on a podcast. And he came up uh, a little bit. We talked about him for maybe an hour, but um, I recently did an analysis of the movie Looker, mm. which is Michael Crichton. Yeah, crazy movie. Um, 1981. I've watched quite a few of his films, and they usually do have predictive programming, but actually he's just somebody I haven't really gotten to yet. But mm. he's definitely somebody I need to get to. I mean, Westworld, ultimately, yeah. you know, Crichton. Um, With a Crowley as the art director. In Westworld? Yeah. Alistair Crowley was the art director? No, 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 no. I'm sorry. In the new Westworld, Nathan Crowley is the art director. Oh. And it, who is that? He's a, a relative of Crowley's, oh. of Alistair Crowley's, and he's also he's part of the Chris Nolan team. Chris Nolan's another person you should look at if you haven't. Uh, well, no, actually, I've, I've written... Yeah, I know you wrote about him, yeah. Five, and then we did uh, three episodes of Hollywood Decoded on Nolan films, I think. I haven't gotten to those yet. Yeah, you'll like those. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I immersed myself quite a bit in Christopher Nolan for those. That was a lot of work. But uh, um, yeah, there's a lot of Jungian, uh, you know, depth psychology going on with 
with the, the no ones for sure. Um, and in the new book, there is a, an, a, an essay on, on Westworld. So, but yeah, you're right. I, I do need to get to more Michael Crichton for sure. Yeah. And it's, it, I just found it interesting that he like left film and started doing mm-hmm. ER. He, he created ER, the TV show, which is oh, your time. Actually, I didn't know that. Oh yeah. So, and he did that, I think pretty much until he died. Well, he's books are full of stuff. So he was definitely getting information somewhere. And, uh, uh, I just finished uh, Annie Jacobson's big fat book on the history of DARPA. And she says at the end of her book that herself and Chris Carter and Gail Ann Hurd, you know, took a special trip to the Pentagon to talk about DARPA. So, so yeah, it's probably this really, <laughs> this really confirms that the science fiction writers, um, are, they do get inside information from, from, the Pentagon from DARPA. Oh, totally. So. Look at, well, not even science fiction. Look at uh, Tom Clancy. Yes. Correct. So, all right. I think, what, Nish, you wanted me to ask Iwalk's question, but I, I don't see it. How do we escape the fuckery? Yeah, something like that. Counteract. I popped into the chat, and I, that's right when I popped in and saw that he had a question. I guess um, the question was, are there any solutions to... Avoid the mind control, other than completely unplugging. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, uh, I believe Orthodox Christianity really is the solution. So, I mean, I'm sure that will be contentious and a lot of people will disagree, but <laughs> no, but that's, my, that's my view. Everyone will love that answer. Well, there you go. All right. Well, that's all that we have tonight for you, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've got all your links in the show notes and on this video and it'll be in the cool. podcast. Awesome. Do you guys care if I mirror this? Not at all. Um, if yes. you don't mind, let me get you a clean copy and edited copy. There'll be the podcast and I'll send you the thumbnail and everything you need to Excellent. put it back up. Jay, thank you so much. This was really a pleasant um, experience and I enjoy your work in the world. Yes, we thank both you. do. You guys are a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. And everyone, thanks for joining us tonight. Be sure to check back next week to see Joshua Kutchin. Forgot he was on next week, who we talked about earlier. Uh, Local Georgia boy. So we'll see you next week, and have a great day.